today uh, our honorable guest is Emil. Um, our, Yo. I think the most mysterious member of our team and uh, also a specialist w- when it comes to substance uh, creating all kinds of textures and helping us with various projects like 3db asset uh, repository also now we are working on a, a collaborative project uh, cabin design architectural visualization and emil is also uh, responsible for texturing in substance yeah. and, and and substance substance we don't mean any kind of illegal substance this time yeah e- uh, i don't know i, I we, we we only see the effect and it's it's cool so maybe there are also other substances involved so i was thinking that maybe emil you could start from saying a few words about yourselves where do you come from uh, how did you start uh, your career in computer graphics yeah sure so yeah my name's emil um i'm currently the uh, content creator for garagefarm.net academy and i used to work in 3db as a uh, 3d modeler and yeah so i got into cg after kind of being a bum for two years uh i, I only attended uh, college for like a year and then I, I kinda had to like drop out because of finances. And for like two years I was a bum. And I think in that time frame I studied like programming on the side and you know, I was just trying to f- find ways to do to make video games. I really wanted to make video games um when I started out. And I think we all started the same way where we all saw Blender Guru's um tutorials. You know, we 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 go into games or any CG and you hear about Blender. What's Blender? It's free. And then we search Blender on YouTube and then oh Blend- who's this Blender Guru guy? And he has like a ton of tutorials. And it was funny because when nobody I think I, I never started out in doing 3D with the attention of being like, I'm gonna make props. I kind of just stumbled into it. Um I I yeah, so I, I studied programming. And I realized I suck at programming. I suck at math, so I can't do that. So, okay, maybe I can do 2D characters. I can draw characters. And I realized, wow, I suck at drawing people. So, okay, maybe I can do 3D characters. And I was like, okay, it turns out you can't really do 3D characters if you suck at 2D. So, okay, maybe I can do props. And that's how I kind of got into it. And yeah, like anything else, you, you learn 3D props, you watch Blender Guru, you eventually learn um, substance and how to texture stuff. And that's, yeah, that's how I got into it. So basically, Andrew Price and Blender Guru is like the vortex sucking thousands of people into 3D from what can I hear? Like yeah. a lot of people, a lot of people start from this donut or other videos. And it's mm-hmm. like, I don't know. I don't know how many people he converted into being a CG artist or, you know, choosing that route. Yeah, but kind of, kind of, that's kind of makes me feel really old because I got into Blender without Enterprise. <laughs> so I, I found yeah, Blender Guru later, later, and recently I've even, even done the donut, <laughs> like post, post, you know, knowing Blender kind of inside out, and then I did the donut. You know, yeah. you can, you can do a lot of. Actually, I'm I'm wondering why why there is no a contest yet, f- year uh, every year contest to do a best donut because you can do so much with donuts. You can do cyberpunk donut. You can do, uh, wasn't you know, wasn't that a thing? Like like his newest video, I think at least at, at yeah, the time he, of recording, he did, he did a project like a NFT, some something about NFTs. Like oh, he, he was planning yeah. to do an NFT made out of different donuts because he thought like uh, so, so many people did donuts, so uh, let, let let them send over their land files and he'll le- render them out in the same way and just make a kind of mosaic out of donuts, right? Yeah, so like a, mo- a donut mosaic picture. Out of donuts. Yeah. Yeah, but still, <laughs> I, I'm still waiting because I sent my donut there, so I'm still <laughs> waiting for for the result. What kind of donut was it? Well, I did. I did a bloody donut, so ah. and, and like <laughs> with a with a razor blade. Spooky. So. Oh Beat. yeah. So so uh, actually, it's a good idea for NFT because this is collectible, like one item, but with various 
variations. So NFT, this all that all that NFT market likes this kind of stuff. But yeah. uh, you said that you studied for some time, so one year. So what did you study? Yeah. So when I went to college, I actually took up um, interactive entertainment. So it's basically game dev in the mm-hmm. Philippines. And but the thing is, what sucked about it was when you go to your to that course. You learn the basic subjects, you know, basic English, basic all that stuff in your first year. And mm-hmm. then you get into the like, cool stuff in your second year. So basically, mm-hmm. I kind of wasted my college getting into it. Oh. Being, I'm, I'm going to make games. Yeah. And then after a year, it's like, wow, I'm, I have to drop out. And I've, ne- uh, you know, th- th- that's just the kind of situation. And yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, so I was thinking that. You know, I remember that in conversation with uh, with uh, with DJ, you said that you don't consider yourself art an artist, that you're a technical guy, and it was surprising for me because I don't know, is it really technical? I, I mean, it's like if, if creating materials is technical, then what really is artistic in 3D? So I I, I don't know if you are very humble or maybe you really think that this is a technical work there's no art part to this Mm, more of i think the way i look at it is there is obviously there is going to be some sort of art into it where you have to know what tools to use in order to create um the asset right you know Mm -hmm. how do you want to make the wood how do you make something if you don't know how to make it right so that, that that's i think that's where the art comes in but a lot of the things in substance is that it's meant, or at least the way I work, is it's it's meant to be flexible to mm-hmm. other people. And I, I think for the listeners uh, who don't know what substance is, um, substance painter is a three D software for painting. It's like uh, it's like three D Photoshop basically. You make a, you put a, you make a three D asset, you put it in painter, and you you just use procedural materials on it. And procedural meaning. I think back in DJ's time or back in your time, we, we talked about it in a previous episode. Mm-hmm. You guys would just like get textures online, I think, which was kind of a gray area. To, and then you did like Photoshop it and then do mm-hmm. it around. Is that that's how you guys did it, right? Back in the day. But but in substance you also use input materials, right? You, you, yeah, or you could you generate everything you know from from procedural uh, from procedures. Uh, yeah, you also import some photos and stuff like that, or or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but that that's that's a cool thing. It's like so, yeah. That, so I said, there's that there's substance painter, and then substance designer is the software where you make materials out of procedural textures. Meaning, if I made a wood texture in designer, I can easily change like, oh, I want to make it brown, or I want to make this wood black, or you can change so many things because of all the numbers and stuff. And what what you mentioned was putting pictures. Uh, you can use Substance Alchemist, which is this AI based software where you can put in photos, of example, like a, a tree or something, or the ground. You put it in Designer, or in, sorry, in Substance Alchemist, and it'll tile it. You can fix it. You can remove the light. You can turn it into a material. And going back to your question about the technical part, um, it's it really is more on the technical side there is that part of me where i i do have to know how to make stuff but it's more of a technical it's like a programmer like if i if i if you needed the material for your room and you needed wood textures and you gave me a a reference like oh please make this um wooden plank texture i would want to make your life easier by putting in as many custom parameters so that if I gave it to you, you'd have what you want. But then what if out of nowhere you're like, huh, I want to make this wood bloody or red or I want to add dirt here or something. You have that option because I thought of that for you in advance. And I think even in studios, that's how they think, right? So that's why I kind of consider it like it's not really an artist thing. It's more on the technical side, like like a programmer. Yeah. But would you create the the let's say the wooden surface of a of a chair just using procedural nodes 
or because in my head is like I have this, in, in my head I have this you know like this this way of thinking that I need to start with some picture and then I can mess with it, but mm-hmm. I need to have some input uh, like raster image. In in rare occasions there are some, for example, some procedural uh, maps in in V-Ray and in 3ds Max, but in most cases I need to find a good picture and then I can do a lot of, of it. But in your case, do you always start from just from some some nodes generating some I don't know mathematical uh, patterns of, or or something like that? <laughs> Hell no! I mean, hmm. so that's that, that's the cool part about Substance is you don't have to make everything from scratch. Um, uh-huh. I mean, like designer, alchemist, painter, they all come with like materials already. So if you wanted to like uh-huh. make a quick texture, just slap it all yeah. on. Yeah, but painting. I guess I guess like Andrew's question is kind of also like is is Substance just purely procedural based or does mm-hmm. it use like a mix of these two like photo based textures and procedural and i guess it's like the other one right like the, the, that you have some procedural aspects of the software and you also mm-hmm. can mix in some photo based uh, imagery but you don't have mm-hmm. to you can mm-hmm. use one or both or the other right am, am yeah. i right yeah yeah Mm, I mean, technically, everything in substance is procedural. I mean, even even scan textures. What what they do is you can scan you, you can scan stuff, right, and put it in Alchemist, and you can turn that photo or whatever into a procedural texture. And I think that's the cool part about it. Like you can just input everything, and you'll always have something good looking at the end. Oh my! Right. Yeah. I got hyped. I got hyped really. So, so uh, because I, I I I've done some quick research and I can see that actually there was a point point when I wanted to learn it, and I noticed that there is substance painter, substance designer, substance alchemist, and source something called source substance yeah. source. Mm-hmm. Substance so, source is kind of like it's kind of like a base of of materials. Yeah, it's a library. To use, right? It's a library. Yeah. So, so if you, I would like to start learning substance, which which of these sub 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 softwares should I start with? Which, uh, which is the first? Again, it, it goes back to it depends on what you need. Um, mm-hmm. Are do you want to make materials? Do you want to paint assets? Do you want to turn your photos into materials to skip the whole mathematical stuff, or do you just want to like buy it off this off the library by subscribing? Uh-huh. And, so I guess. Yeah. sources that that buy buy one right i mean uh, you, you only really get points for subscribing to the software so mm-hmm. i guess that's the closest thing you get to buying it but i'd say if if, if you want to start out painter's the easiest <laughs> it's funny because um some people find designer easier like my girlfriend like she hates painter but she loves mm-hmm. design and she wants to do the math it's like okay um so, yeah so, so what's the d- difference between uh working in designer and painter because i understand that in painter you have you import the model and you paint right with the brushes or with some effects on it uh i don't know if i if there's a, so i will give you an example i i made a model of some like 18th century pistol and i would like to mm-hmm. make it the best it can like to look the best it can look like the the steel the rust the 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 the, the wood so which one I should use which one of this program I should use to to texture it and make cool materials. Technically, you can use both Designer and Painter to do the same thing. Um, hmm. The difference is um, the the way that the, the cool thing about uh, texturing software nowadays is you can use maps that you bake from your mesh in order to create um, effects. So, for example, you have that pistol, right? And then you mm-hmm. bake out an ambient occlusion. You, you we know that ambient occlusion is basically the shadow map where the shadows mm-hmm. are in the mesh. So you can mm-hmm. use that map to like, oh, what if I want to add like I don't know mold or something in mm-hmm. the shadowy parts? You can use that to drive the effect. And so they're basically the same thing. The only difference is you paint. You can paint. So you had like this three D something like ZBrush. You you paint the uh, you rotate yeah. the model. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah, you you can kind of like paint like normal maps on it or 
whatever, just reflection maps, everything. So yeah. You can, oh. It's like more manual, right? If you, if you want to get a manual tweak here and there, so Painter is the way to go. Yeah, and but if you're to... doing it like general, just using the maps only and smart materials, and you both both work out fine. Uh, my my mistake was um for me, yeah, I guess just going back. Anyone who wants to do it on a three D asset, just use Painter. Mm-hmm. Wanna make materials, use Designer. Or if you wanna do it in nodes, use Designer. And it's similar mm-hmm. to I think the material library in three three D S Max and also in Blender's Node Editor is pretty much the same thing. But I I noticed that uh, I watched some videos of of Substance Painter or or Designer, and and I noticed that of course th- these are maps. But they are rendered al- already because maps are just maps. Now you need to light them and uh, put them into right slots of right, you know, like light bouncing effects. So does it mean that Substance Painter has its own render engine, which is helping to, you know, visual visualize this, uh, this this design? Yeah, it's just just uh, your typical um, 3D view, like like uh, it's kind of like mm-hmm. EV, but not really. <laughs> like, uh-huh. Yeah, pretty pretty straightforward. But it does have a render engine for rendering uh, final images called IRA, and that was mm-hmm. developed by Nvidia. You can use that. It's, oh, a, yeah, it's a path based yeah. render that you can mm-hmm. use for rendering. But yeah. I, I wanted to ask you guys, like, mm-hmm. uh, it seems like you don't use Substance, right? So why mm. don't you guys use Substance? Like the I mean, I mean, I have I have used it for mm-hmm. a bunch of projects, but the, not really dug very deep into it. Like the, I, I kind of didn't really implement this into my daily work. For now, like I used the, I use materials from Substance, because, uh, for, so so to, just to generate maps for, from it. But you don't really even have to use the the software because you have the Substance player, right? So mm-hmm. if you if you get a as uh, this SBSR file right with, yeah. with some with some mm, just sliders exposed, so you can prepare a version of the material right. Uh, yeah, how, how just, with, just with just with player. Yeah, but I I just kind of like dipped my fingers into it and it, mm-hmm. and I found it's kind of it's pretty intuitive to learn really because I didn't spend very much time on it and I was able to to output a textured asset out of it Mm -hmm. so yeah basically i was i was also curious about how it compares to blenders uh to blenders uh, internal possibilities because uh, blender already has some kind of a node-based material system and some texture painting features which are kind of lacking like there there are add-ons to to complement that that workflow like i've seen like a guy producing some add-ons i think it was called mask tools or Mm -hmm. something like that it's kind of like going in the direction where, where, uh, substance is right. So yeah. adding some procedural yeah. masking or overlays and uh, some things is easier tweakable than in just vanilla Blender. Yeah, I guess you might say I'm not yet using <laughs> using yeah, substance yeah, yeah. in a daily basis, but I'm also kind of having peep peeps uh, across the other side of the of the mm-hmm. uh, of the scene, which is a uh, Quixel mixer, and I wanted to ask you about uh, whether you always just stick to to substance, or have you uh, mm-hmm. also checked our, uh, out uh, other alter- alternatives, like like for example, Quixel mixer or Armor Paint, for example. Mm-hmm. So this yeah, is like yeah. an up and coming younger uh, brother to all of, to the bigger players. I think what sets substance apart from Quixel mixer and Armor Paint is kind of like the discussion between. And no offense if no, uh, people get offended by this. Um, using Photoshop versus GIMP versus Microsoft Paint. Like, technically, you can do the same thing in all of them. But how fast you get there is completely different. Like, I'm sure you guys have seen on YouTube, like, somebody painted the Mona Lisa in freaking Microsoft Paint, right? Or, yeah, like, so, or like people are like, no, GIMP is better than Photoshop. GIMP Master Race. They are... Like, kind of like how Blender was early on. Like, who we don't need Maya, we don't need 3ds Max, we need Blender. Blender's the best one. It's kind of like the same th- that same thing where, in yeah, like what you said, Substance Painter or, is pretty intuitive to anybody who opens software. 
um Crystal Mixer are also pretty intuitive, especially recently when they released um their newest version. But even playing around, there is still a bit of like a learning curve, like uh this seems kinda inconvenient. Why is it here? Why is it here? And same thing with armor paint, like this is cool, this is paid once, you don't have to subscribe to Adobe if you hate Adobe. But it's also a bit more work to get to the effect that you want, that you can do in half the time if you were decent at substance. But they're mm. but they're really good. I think Quixel Mixer's um materials are way better because it's photos uh it's photo scan. But yeah, that, that's what I think. But I, I know that you joined the team of 3db because that was our product um um and still it's in development the um repository of architecture visualization assets and you just said that you joined it as a modeler mm -hmm. and i thought that you joined as a texture artist so when you joined the 3db you you didn't know substance yet you just learned it on the way as working on the assets modeling Nah, honestly, I got hired, like, it feels like an accident almost, like, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, like, going back, so I was kind of a bum for, like, two years, and I decided to take on 3D props, right? And I'm mm -hmm. making 3D props, I'm like, okay, what do I need to texture? Oh, substance. So, there's a, this thing where you can use your student ID to get a student license to use substance painter for free. So, that's what mm -hmm. I used. Uh, I, I used it, I played around with it, and what I did was I put everything on Sketchfab. Because I was running mm -hmm. out of space on my really crappy laptop. And then mm -hmm. eventually, for some reason, somebody looked at my Sketchfab and we were like, hey, we're, we're looking for someone to for a 3D uh, massive thing. Would you like to be scheduled for an interview? And I had no idea. I'd end up getting hired from posting my homework on Sketchfab. I wasn't even expecting it at all. So mm -hmm. yeah, when I got hired, 3D models, man. Like I, 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 I knew Substance when I got in. Yeah, but that's yeah. that's that's just one takeaway for our listeners. If you don't, if you can hide your stuff on your hard drive, don't do that. Like post it yeah. anywhere, anywhere, because yeah. you never know who's Show looking. <laughs> you never Show know who's looking. Like I would have never gotten hired had I kept it in my hard drive. Yeah. By the way, you said that um, uh, the you can on, also render with uh, iRay on mm -hmm. on. So so this is uh, this Nvidia render engine, and we don't don't support it on on our cloud farm yet, <clears throat> but I know that it works very well <clears throat> on our desktop servers because mm -hmm. um, this is Nvidia. We have in, uh, we have uh, we have Nvidia cards, and also it's used very often with Dust 3D. It's mm -hmm. it's it's attached to some 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 software. So just a little uh, remind, reminder, if you'd like to check IRA, you can check it in our access top with huge number of, of, of cards. Yeah, pretty, so, cool, so, pretty cool. So, so if, I would like to, if I would like to start learning Substance, what would be the best road to do this? Like, because you know what, you, you, ask, you asked that, why we don't use Substance and for example, I didn't use Substance because I had my own ways of creating materials and textures in V-Ray, my own way. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I there's a lot of this software like mm, to create, for example, maps. There was a, I remember there was a crazy bump and stuff like that. And I got intimidated by this. I, mm -hmm. I, I you know, like I, I work at GarageFarm.net. I have a lot of technical work to do at, at the farm. And now it looks like this huge machine because it has this sub sub softwares, and I was thinking, Jesus, how how long it will take me to learn it to do something like two years or something? So I was basically kind of you know um, you know repelled because mm -hmm. I thought that this is too much too much work to even get to a decent level. Yeah, but I think I think it's like like Amy said that it's not that hard. As it seems, maybe at the beginning, because it's you have you have the tutorials for all the software uh, on their official channels. So you have for for Substance a quite nice introductory series of tutorials, or f the same for Quixel. Like I think right now it's kind of easy to jump into it. Like and it's it's not like two years of hard grinding 
to get to something decent. Mm -hmm. Especially that you have so many ready mates to use, like the materials prepared already. It's not like a, that you have to build everything from scratch. Like if you want to be a you know substance PhD, right? That might be a different story. But mm -hmm. just to get mm -hmm. some things looking good, it's right now just a matter of I you know, think more of a weeks than than years right yeah honestly for two years i'd say two weeks man like um so a lot of the tutorials that i make for garage farm academy i actually base off of what substance does like wes mcdermott is the the lead tutorial guy in substance and wow he makes the best tutorial videos that i at least for me i've seen on youtube the way he explains designer and painter and alchemist it's so detailed and super informative without being like, oh, I want to fall asleep. Because when I was learning 3D early on from Blender, even from Blender Guru, I'd fall asleep during the tutorial. I was like, what the hell is he talking about? But mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of Substance Academies or uh, the Substance Channels um, videos, they're really good. So if you want, if you really, really, really wanted to learn anything from painter, designer, or alchemist, you just spend like maybe a week, maybe two weeks, and then you're you're pretty good to go. And everything else is mm -hmm. gonna be based on like how good you are at like looking at stuff, I guess. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Yeah. That's that's uh, I guess that's the most most crucial thing in every 3D workflow or whatever. Just developing the eye to see what's really yeah. going on, right? That's, yeah. I, that's the hard part. Like the, I wanted to ask you also about the mm -hmm. texturing workflow. What, mm -hmm. what would you find like the hardest part in that? Because you know there are a lot of tools of making that are making things mm -hmm. the, as easy as possible, but there must be some things that you know it's hard to grasp something in, in this. But what would you, what would it be the hardest part? Mm -hmm. For me, it's definitely the it's it's the roughness and the story of the asset. Because I think one of the first noob mistakes that most starters um have is when you when you get painter you'll have this thing you'll, you'll have materials like your basic procedural materials but right under it it's called smart materials and smart materials are materials that are uh basically layers that are based on the mass that you bake so you'll have something like dirty rusty metal you if you slap it on a texture nothing's gonna happen but when you bake maps substance is gonna look at it and be like oh, okay Rusty metal. So I'm going to put the rust here based on your curvature map and your ambient occlusion. So you're going to have a mm -hmm. really dirty, rusty looking piece of metal instantly. And what a lot of beginners do is, oh, look, I got painter. Drag, drop, done. And that, and the thing is, just because it looks good at first does not mean you're done. You have to make sure like, okay, let's say you look at your keyboard right now. I'm pretty sure for most people or i guess gamers you're gonna see wasd is gonna be really oily or your space bar is gonna be really oily or shinier compared to the rest of your keyboard mm -hmm. right or when you look at your your dinner table and you just swipe it clean after eating dinner you're probably gonna see a bit of like white wipe texture or maybe you have like you're wearing glasses right now you look at your glasses you're gonna see fingerprints or you wiped it with a microfiber cloth it's gonna have this streak oily streak almost so mm -hmm. that's hard getting that done the roughness right and also get, figuring out where to put effects to dictate the story of the asset is re for me the the make it or break it if you get it right it's gonna look amazing if you look at any movie right now if you watch iron man one and you look at iron man's helmet you're gonna see so many fingerprints because obviously it's his helmet he's gonna be touching that with his bare fingers but mm -hmm. Any other asset, if you make that wrong, if you I don't know, if you put like a coffee stain on his helmet, that doesn't make sense. Why is there a coffee stain in his helmet? That that's kind of the thing with texturing. You can easily make something look really good because of how PBR works. PBR makes everything look really decent instantly. But it's the storytelling and the roughness that's that sets you apart from the rest in my opinion yeah and i think i think one thing also that would be uh, kind of fitting into what you're talking about is also finding that sweet spot like not not to overdo stuff mm -hmm. and not to like underdo uh the effects and uh, yeah because yeah. i've seen a lot of a lot of 3d artists have the tendency of going like overboard with dirt grime grime whatever just put on every 
possible, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. possible damage on, on the surface. So make it overly damaged or, or overly clean. Uh, and the same way with, with roughness, what you said, like roughness is probably the key because, uh, yeah. Yeah, like it's hard. Usually yeah, when you look at the portfolio of an artist, he, he usually either has a, you know, a tendency of making everything a bit too shiny or a little mm -hmm. bit too matte, right? Yeah. So yeah. The, the ones that hit that golden spot in the middle, they, they are the, the, the most oh, yeah, amazing yeah. ones. Cool. The cool, cool thing though was like um, there's this thing I just discovered like literally like three weeks ago. Um, there's this thing in Painter called PBR Validate. So it's this thing where you slap it on your texture and it looks at your texture and says, hey, this thing is wrong. This is a physically based change it. So mm -hmm. for example, you have like metal, right? And you look at somebody's portfolio and they put like a metal, met like let's say, I don't know, an espresso machine and it's metallic. And then I, I, don't, I don't know how you, you guys think about it when the base color is like really low, that's actually wrong. Metal is supposed to be a specific value in the gray or the high grays. So do you the, mean the the not the reflection, but the the so so quote unquote diffuse? I think so. I, I really don't get the technical part of that aspect, but it does check it. So if you ever if you're ever in doubt of like the if your PBR textures, if it's like mm -hmm. following the rules, slap it on. If your model is all green, you're good to go. If it's not, uh, you're gonna have to like change something from your diffuse mm -hmm. to maybe your roughness, like something. Yeah. Um, because various metals, even the the white metals, have a uh, various uh, various brightness. Yeah. And yeah. in general, actually, this is what I learned uh, from. Uh, you know, I learned uh, creating shaders based on V-Ray model. So basically, mm -hmm. for me, V-Ray model from these old you know versions like one two it was for me the model of materials which i was trying to understand and also you know observation and stuff like that and only so for example we would do that that the for example the um, the diffuse color of let's say steel was dark gray and then you you mm. added some metallic um reflections made with ior and some th th there was a this word shader and uh, i watched some time ago i watched uh, andrew price video and it was like mind-blowing for me that metals don't have the um, diffuse color at all because diffuse is not only a color diffuse is actually the process of it's something like subsurface scattering on a very mm -hmm. on a very shallow level so basically all metals are black they just diff they are just different in amount of the reflection of this metallic reflection and yeah so so for me it was more or less um so so that 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 explained that to me however you know i like to figure f things out and i remember i checked on wikipedia on wikipedia you can uh, check uh, how materials look like when they are grinded like grinded grinded steel uh, i don't know if i say it correctly in english uh, or grinded um chrome so for example chrome is basically black when you grind it or uh, iron is dark let's say middle dark gray so so yeah so so these colors these colors uh come come from that from from the fact that the the metals don't don't have this diffuse diffuse color basically they have they absorb everything expect everything except what they reflect with metallic reflection Mm -hmm. So yeah, okay. I lost. I I lost a track a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Explain yeah, that, that. That's that's the thing though. Like I remember talking to DJ about this. Like learning 3D at first, you'd have like older tutorials, right? And they'd be talking mm -hmm. about oh I O R, um, yeah. but this yeah. value and like well, th th I think that's the kind of the cool thing about PBR and substance in general, where you don't have to think about that stuff anymore. You can kind of like dumb it down to like is this metal? Yes, good. Yeah. white metallic okay but just, yeah but, just a switch. Yeah, 
I was very interested in that. And actually mm-hmm. in your conversation, in your last conversation with DJ about the fact that you didn't use IOR and I, as I understood, you even didn't bother to, to you know, like uh, fig- figure it out because so i as i as i understand the pbr like the pbr workflow is only making a distinction between metallic and non-metallic materials yeah. right yeah so but also there is that effect called fresnel reflection mm-hmm. and it's uh, visible both on metallic and on not metallic um uh, materials so does it mean that in substance painter uh, okay, little digression. Uh, when I saw Andrew Price video about creating uh, PBR materials in uh, in some older version of um, of the uh, how it's called, how it's called this uh, Blender render uh, mm, in Blender renderer this this in main Blender. one. Blender internal or cycles right now? In cycles, I guess. Oh, he had to cycles. use some tricks. So basically he finally decided that all non-metallic materials have one IOR value and metallic ones have some little differences. So when you work w- with this uh, PBR workflow in substance, do you just do you just assume that this is non-metallic and you don't care about the Fresnel IOR or you just drop the I don't know gold or chrome and it automatically has this uh, has this proper IOR of of frontal reflection honestly I have no clue um I remember uh-huh. I remember reading about Fresnel and stuff but yeah like doing the PBR stuff it's it's stuff that they talked about but then when you're actually making textures, it's not really something I think about. It's like, oh, is this metal or not? Cool. White. Add texture, add roughness, I'm done. If, if, if I, that, that's, that's something I actually don't know anything about. If, if there is something more technical about it, I feel like it might be connected to the actual shaders in the engine mm-hmm. itself. So, yeah. yeah. yeah I, guess, I guess it's taken care of uh, by the renderer. Yeah. Not the, te- not the textures as much. Exactly. Have, yeah. yeah. Seems like more yeah, a shader but- thing. Yeah, it's like, you know, like some kind of uh, curve or whatever number. But Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, because actually I was interested if you uh, create uh, a material in substance, if you import it, for example, to V-Ray, is it a ready shader or you just import the maps, which you then use in slots of, let's say, V-Ray standard material? I was was curious. Mm, If Yes and no. Um, the thing is, not all softwares have, so Substance has this thing called the Substance plugin, where some, some Substance mm-hmm. uh, softwares, you can in- install the plugin and you can just export your uh, .sbsar file and just mm-hmm. drag, in, drag it in or your SBS file. And you can use that, it comes with parameters. So inside your software, like let's say Unreal Engine or 3D, uh, sorry, 3ds Max, you can just play with the sliders just like in designer or in painter but um so for those ones i'd i'd say i guess the the shade is already made for you because you're using the plugin to drive everything but mm-hmm. if you don't have it like i think blender doesn't have it then you have to import it traditionally using maps and then connect it to the shader and make it yourself but in my experience i never had to really think about what IOR value to use or whatever. The only time I've ever had to think about that was when I worked on 3DB and I was asked like, oh, can you render everything, attach everything to the VRE material and render it? And then I looked at it and I was like, oh, what the hell are these? What's an IOR? Oh no, <laughs> where's the thingy? So that's that's my experience with it. You know what? Finally, uh... I remember when I learned uh, when I learned uh, you know V-Ray materials and V-Ray, I was trying to find as much you know hardcore uh, technical data as I can to just you know okay th- that's te- ticked off okay I don't have to care about it, and I was uh, for example I was um, experiment- exp- experimenting with uh, uh, all kinds of IORs for non-metallic materials. 
And for example, in Andrew Price video, he just uses 1.6 1, 1, 1. or 1.55 and that's it. And, I've, uh, and, and I, I have never really found a good table of IOR uh, numbers for frontal reflections mm. for various materials. Only for, you know, the IOR is also used for uh, refraction and for refraction there are tables because for example water and let's say water and glass have different values like mm. I even remember them so but also it was like two materials and then there was like completely useless materials like gold like let's say let's say diamond uh, ruby and stuff like that the whole the whole list of of some pre precious precious stones mm -hmm. so unless was... you're just unless you're a jewelry jewelry designer <laughs> yeah in yeah. that case it's important like yeah but yeah also, also for metal it was it was you know i so i was trying to understand some stuff and i i spent you know i don't know for sure days if not weeks just watching all the stuff around me and uh, under various angles so basically you know i was not I wasn't wasting any moment to learn. So basically, for I was standing on the bus stop, I was watching on the, let's say, the the, the paint on the bus stop from mm -hmm. various points to see is it you know how it works and stuff. But finally, from what what I, I can see now, it's <laughs> simplicity is is the answer. Like I I've never lear learned the difference between various let's say various types of plastic or whatever or rubber when it comes to when it comes to IOR of the frontal mm -hmm. reflection I guess it's I don't know maybe it's just 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 to make it look correct and that, that, yeah but it. one thing one thing I wanted to ask about uh, like in in this similar vein that you, you were you were talking Andrew about uh, observing the the world around you and and that kind of relates to to the photo based textures because you know they are kind of they are captured that way. You you observe, you observe, you you capture it through a camera, and then you have some data from the from the real world, and then you have you wanna re, uh, like remake it in the virtual space, uh, which is what the what the texturing is for, right? You are trying to kind of make, unless you're trying to make something like out of, out of this world, but usually we're we're trying to kind of uh, remake the the real world in the digital space. And there are two ways of that. Like one is the photo based, and the the other one is the procedural one. Mm -hmm. And there were there were times where where kind of the procedural look was, you know, was very very easy, easily uh, distinguishable from yeah. the photo based workflow because you know you could you could immediately track that this is just a you know Voronoi texture or or yeah. some other no noise pattern that is that is re that is uh, recognizable. And it was really hard to make like out of these basic, you know, mathematical uh, structures to make something that kind of resembled the real world, mm -hmm. which I think is not the case anymore because there are so many advancements in this area. And as you said, in the substance mm -hmm. designer, for example, you have options to make things from purely from procedural workflow that that kind of all, already make. Uh, a nice looking material that is almost in, indistinguishable from a photo based yeah, material. Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree. Um, I, recently, uh, I was working on like a food asset. And I wanted to like do food, and I realized, wow, texturing food is sucky when you're using procedural te textures. Like trying to make corn, you look at corn, you're like, oh, I can make that in Blender, and then you start texturing it, and like, wow, I didn't know putting yellow on it was was gonna work was was gonna be this hard. And there is that thing where, for example, like photo scanning, photogrammetry, that is way more efficient in terms of capturing the data of a real life object, especially something like food, compared to doing procedurally. Like in the wrong hands, you can't tell that somebody just, you, you can see the Voronoi texture, you can see the wood fiber texture. Like you can tell, right? But that's, that, that's, that, that's kind of the argument, right? Where, uh, so, Cap, if you guys know Resident, you guys know Resident Evil, right? The, the game series, uh, Capcom for the longest time, I think they were making it in, they were just texturing it the normal way, the game textures, and then ever since they released the RE engine, and then they 
switch to Resident Evil 7 and 8, most of the assets they do are photogrammetry. They have like a photo scan um, studio and everything they do is photo scan. So that's kind of where the efficiency lies, where you can spend the money to make your own photogrammetry setup to, m- to capture everything in real life, but then you're limited to st- stuff that you can make in real life or you're really good at procedural textures. It's not, it might not look as good as photo scans unless you're talented. But you do have the flexibility of like, oh, at least I can make this plastic dark or light or orange. So that's that's kind of where it lies, that other argument. Yeah, so so still it's kind of like not... Uh, I, I just wonder uh, what, what's your view uh, about this uh, for the future? Like, will the... You know, we, we all know that photogrammetry is kind of like also developing, so everything's mm-hmm. achievable in that technology, but... Uh, the procedural thing is also advancing it's uh, yeah you have mm-hmm. more uh, more to base upon right it's it's not like you have to to, to do everything from scratch you can already use some pre-mates uh, some, mm-hmm. some stuff so so i'm just wondering what's what's going to win or is it going to be always like the, the two worlds uh, <laughs> that, that's in some cases in some cases yeah. this and in some cases that or or is that going somewhere that procedural is going to yeah, take over yeah, everything yeah. for example yeah that's a debate that will never end i, f- I feel like um because there are cases for photo scans like quicksil everything they do is photo scan there is a place for that it, it's very difficult to beat real life if you're trying to like mm-hmm. make something in cg if you have something if you have like a, a tree or something you'd rather just scan the tree and put it in your scene but then at the same time if you're after scale or trying to make something at a bigger scale, nothing beats proceduralism. If I wanted to make, uh, I feel like you this this where geometry nodes and Blender could be helpful, right? If you wanted to make a building, would you rather go around, bring a drone, photo scan New York City, mm-hmm. or would you rather mm-hmm. just play with some math to create everything in like seconds? Yeah, but but then on the other hand, if you want to make, for example, a tree and you want to make it grow. And mm-hmm. that's the case where where you know Houdini jumps in and yeah that want that want to do like VFX, uh, advanced you know animation stuff. That's kind of where all the procedural magic comes in, and it helps to to yeah to ju- just try to find this formula that makes that makes it lo- that makes it looks look or grow this way in nature. And mm-hmm. if you have that formula, that's kind of maybe that's kind of a person of the you know of the theory of everything, right? That's, mm-hmm. People just want to know how things work and then to be able to play God in a way, like, just yeah. to... That, that's this a cool a... thing, though, because, like, there's this uh, artist, uh, his name is Daniel Tiger, or Tiger, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, but he makes amazing. He's one of, like, the substance designer gods. Uh, if you look up it, look up it, look him up on ArtStation, he, he made this render of, like, this tree in Marmoset Toolbag, which is more like a game render thing. And that tree looks amazing. And he made that thing in designer. So there is this thing where if you are talented enough and you're seriously good at procedural stuff, you can definitely match, if not beat, real life. But that is, I think, for like the very, very elite level of artistry. Ma- or magicians. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's just like you, you can you can do like super crazy photorealistic painting uh, drawings with a pencil. Yeah. If you have the things. patience and you have and you have the eye, right? So yeah. I've yeah I've seen like uh, people doing super super photorealistic renders with uh, the old engine of Blender, like the internal render engine, which was kind of like re- very outdated. It was like replaced by cycles later on mm-hmm. because it was not really realistic out of the box. But but if you really knew what you wanted to achieve, you just did some hacks here and yeah. there. You just want you just had to know where to put those hacks and to, to make it look really photorealistic. I mean, yeah. It's it really, was achievable. Right? Yeah, it's, it's cool because there was this uh, recent corridor digital video where you, you guys would know that Terminator 2 scene where that iron, uh, that iron Terminator Mercury yeah. guy, he goes through the, the bars, right? Through the bars. Yeah. And then the cool thing is they were like, oh, we're going to recreate this with modern technology. One guy, uh, Peter, decided to go for photo scanning his face, uh, Ren's face, and then putting it in Blender and using Lattice Modify, which is just like the Lattice Magic video on the Academy. Please check that out. And yeah, he tried to do that thing using a real photo scan and then modern technology in Blender with like high-end gear. And then Ren, I think he used uh 
he used a, a photo of him, uh, no, a video of him going through, and then he he did like he used a three D model of a scan to look do the geometry. So they both had modern technology with super fast PCs, everything that's advanced, the best cycles, photo, everything. They get like top of the line stuff, and they couldn't beat that old shot because they couldn't. They, they couldn't. The old, the mm. old, the old thing was like running on like some. I think ILM was, was the studio did the effects, and they couldn't beat that. Even though that movie's like thirty years old or something, so I think that's the cool thing where it's not really the tech anymore, but it's the artist who can like push the tech to its limit. If not, if if not advanced enough, that even modern tech can't beat it, right? Yeah, I I think that these guys in these times when they didn't have you know this these computers, they they had a lot of technical very original ideas and tricks like m- mixing the mixing the effect from the computer with some you know real tricks with yeah. i don't know play doh and whatever to, to to get this effect yeah it's hard but, uh, I, i'm curious uh, the uh, except substance what software are you using the most Mm, again, d- depends on what I use, and for at least for a lot of the stuff I do for the academy, I kind of have to use everything, you know, painter to do this, and then designer to do that, and again, it's 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 based. Um, but for example, for rendering, do you do your own scenes, like you know, pro- just scenes, just just images, like or whatever ArcVis or some whatever scenes with some software. Like, I don't know. Mm, I'm not there yet. I mean, I've been playing around with Unreal Engine 4 and doing props. So I've been mostly using Painter for texturing assets. And yeah, I actually wanted to ask you this, you both a while ago was, where do you draw the line between putting so much effort into this the technical side of something and then something new comes in and you're like, wow, I'm not going to jump it. Because I think, for example, the, the, we had this discussion over Unreal Engine where people, like I'm learning Unreal Engine, and every time you need to bake lighting, you have to press the button, bake the lighting, wait a couple seconds, and then boom, your lighting works. But then in Unreal Engine 5, everything is dynamic. So you have like global illumination dynamically, and with, like you, barely, you don't even have to optimize your assets anymore using Nanite, right? So, mm-hmm. I, I, and like I guess with, with PBR, all I have to do is like mess with some sliders while you doing your shaders. You have to think about, oh, I have to make sure this is the right IOR for glass or something. So I wanted to ask, like, where do you draw the line between, hey, the industry is moving forward and I'm here. Is what I know worth staying before or do I abandon what I have right now and catch up to the industry? Hmm. That's for me, hard. for me, it's a hard question because you know, for years I worked as a technical guy on on the farm, so I stopped doing bigger projects when it comes to 3D. Uh, right now, recently, I started to play with Chaotica, uh, 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 which is more like a hobby software because I like to get quickly some cool images. But I think that the the basics are most important. If you could do a very cool image in like 10 years ago in some software then if you would like to go back to some other software like new one i think i think it's it's going to be quite yeah. easy like, I, I, or, or I at think, least you know like updating I think that, your knowledge. that you kind of yeah you kind of um uh answered your question a little bit in the in the course of the covers in the course of the conversation, it's when when we asked you about what, how you started out out with everything. You just wanted to make games, right? So that was like your focus, and I think that that's that's kind of the answer to your question, like focusing on what you really want to do next. Like, of course, the industry is moving somewhere in a lot of places in a lot of directions, and it's changing. Like, there are new new industries popping out, and uh, it will always always be changing. But you have to. You know, really uh, tell yourself, you know, answer yourself, uh, what where you are heading, right? It's yeah. like, of course, you can follow the the industry, but generally, you have to find your place in in there somewhere. And some there is something that you want to do. Like for example, you had you you wanted to to make games or things for games. So I guess you have to kind of see 
what really in these games you want to do and just find ways of most efficiently doing that, right? That's like you said, you, for texturing, you found Substance the, the best tool for for your workflow. Like I wanted to, to make architectural visualizations. I started learning Blender back in the days and I, I don't regret it. And still, it's not the only thing that I learned. For example, I, I had to do tutorials for uh, for the current jobs uh, job I have. So I learned DaVinci Resolve. I'm still learning it while doing this stuff that I need to do. So I yeah, guess it's and just... You, you, you learned DaVinci Resolve and let's say now several years passed, you, you go to some other company and they tell you, you know what, we are not cutting in DaVinci, we are cutting in, 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 in let's say, Avid. And yeah. you need to learn Avid, but you don't have to learn how to cut the yeah, I think yeah, video. the basics are are the same anyway because the the tools they differ, but generally they do the same stuff. Like if you if you're shooting photos with a Canon camera and suddenly you have to start using Nikon or something other, it's it might be a bit different, but it's not that much different, right? Well, maybe that's a bad you know yeah bad example. But isn't there, too similar? But yeah, isn't, isn't there this argument though where if you're too outdated you are hurting your chances because i remember i think before um companies would outsource um smaller companies in let's say india or something to like hey we have a crap ton of assets please uv unwrap so all they do is like all day long they just uv unwrap and then eventually mm-hmm. like right now uv unwrapping tools became really advanced so a lot yeah. of those guys don't have a job anymore so yeah, yeah, I guess you have to be flexible anyway. Yeah. And I think that you you are kind of in a nice position where this software is kind of still young. You know, it's developing the texturing software and the procedural tools there. Mm-hmm. This don't, this seems like a trend for a longer time, don't, right? Don't, to, don't, be, don't to be place. creating pipelines for, for game creation for asset creations, like procedurally making like automating stuff because there's like the demand for assets will always grow, right? So yeah. it's just going to need more and more and more flexible, more different, yeah, more variations and stuff like that. So I guess you're in a good position of starting out to, to the industry, right? You you already know some of programming stuff, even if you said that you suck in programming, you, you kind of have the mindset already. And with the procedural tools, it's, it's all a little bit the same. Like it's, it's just making procedures to, to create stuff. Yeah. Whether it's programming or texturing or whatever else. So these guys who learned only to unwrap, I think they invested too much into one skill and one software rather than rather than, you know, maybe being texture artists and unwrap would be just part of their skills. I I don't know what kind of what kind of um skills you can take from this unwrapping workflow and apply it to some other some other um you know specialization on the other hand i noticed that good companies usually when something ends like let's say we don't need this kind of stuff anymore they very often give opportunities to workers to to you know to rebrand i don't know how to how, how to call it mm-hmm. to to relearn re- yeah yeah because for example they know the workflow of working on computer games in general and uh, and, and and stuff like that well i i, I just have just <laughs> one more question because when it comes to this substance do you need to use tablet uh, when you work or you work with mouse mm, pens i mean the only one that really has pen pressure uh sensitive um options i think is alchemist and painter uh so yeah you can, you can like like the name says you can paint right but then designer is mode based so if you have a tablet and you really want to paint on your textures and pbr isn't always just uh our painter isn't just a pbr texture software it is a texturing suite so if you wanted to make like textures for like old games or like mobile stuff or anything that doesn't mm-hmm. use or stylized stuff right you don't need the other stuff you can always paint everything you don't need the, the, the super realistic materials then you can just use a pen. But mm-hmm. if you only have a mouse, it's also perfectly fine. You can just put some sliders on, mask this, mask that, you're good to go. 
and yeah i mean i, I guess the barrier and entry is really low just just jump into it like it, it, it won't take long the academy is really 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 good like west is amazing and yeah just dive into it yeah so so it's yeah so it's kind of the same the same as in cloud rendering right the barrier of entry is really low you have the test credits for a start if you haven't yet used a cloud render farm right yeah you just re- register have the free credits to test it out and then just start using it when you have a deadline and a product to render yeah by the way by the way there is that uh, sentence about good computer games so the formula is easy to play hard to master so i guess recently a lot of software is created like that for example this new unreal easy to play of course you can just jump right in mm-hmm. hard to master if you want to be a master of unreal it will, it will take you time and 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 effort and and talent yeah and actually i have some technical questions about substance for example you mm-hmm. know there's that nightmare of all textured artists and and cg artists of 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 visible seams between mm-hmm. the the so it's it's very easy to just create a seamless seamless um uh, seamless uh, texture where you don't where you can't see the seams but you can see the re- repetitiveness for example because there is some kind of uh, bigger pattern or like this one orange orange uh, brick in the mm-hmm. wall which is so does does substance have some ways to overcome it like to 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 get rid of of of, of this repetitiveness in bigger scale like like, like mm-hmm. I don't know another overlay of colors or stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I actually discussed this in my five tips for painters, so please check that out. But there is this thing called triplanar projection. So there's two ways. One is triplanar projection. So all so the way textures work, right? Is usually it's you have a UV unwrap and the texture is projected onto that UV island. That's how it. But that's where the seams come from, right? If you have two textures and two different islands, there is going to be a seam in the middle. So you just mm-hmm. switch it. To, you all you need to do is click the tri- triplanar projection, and boom, seams are gone magically, which is really helpful. But if let's say you can't do that, you can also paint it out using a clone stamp tool. So mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, but but you know, seams themselves are easy to do in Photoshop, like with the offset or with clone stamp. Mm-hmm. But let's say that you have some very big wall, and you don't, and some features are even if you, there is no seams at all there will be that let's say lighter part of the wall uh repeating f- like 10 meters 10 meters that it, and and you can see this is uh this is fake this is not completely mm, random yeah. through all the, f- the so is there a way in substance to mm. to get rid of it i mean at, at that point every every single seamless texture you will ever work with whether it's procedural or a photo scan will always look tiled and yet styled enough. But I guess that's where vertex painting comes in, right? And Unreal Engine and Blender, where you mix in material decals to like break up mm-hmm. the monotony and to hide that tiling texture. And, yeah, yeah, there are there are also also techniques uh, developed on that, right? Like using other maps to just distort the placement of the texture, uh, yeah, mix it differently than just yeah, just tiling straight ahead. Add, adding dirt stuff like that yeah yeah mixing two textures together you know different different ways of doing that like i've seen i think uh lux render was working on something like that uh, a, a way of randomly placing the texture over a larger piece of mesh um i think corona also had introduced some kind of a some kind of a tweak for that so it's yeah it's something that you do rather in the, in your 3d software later on with the textures yeah yeah mm-hmm. it's just texturing you, you can't at the end of the day it's, it's still based on your eye how do you get around these problems to fit, get to the product mm-hmm. that you want yeah yeah and it, 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 is there a feature to animate textures like some special feature for yeah. animated yeah, textures yeah 100% um 
uh, I forgot the name for it, but there is this thing where you can use properties in Designer to animate stuff. So I've seen people make fire. I've seen people make procedural mm-hmm. clocks. Like it's it's doable, but again, that's that's diving into like the technical functions of Designer, and it, it is it is techy stuff. Like even I don't know that stuff yet. But yeah. Uh-huh. Wow, so it sounds very, very powerful. Yeah, it's like what you said. I, easy easy to play, hard to master. There's, there's a lot of stuff you can do, but can you do it? Yeah, I noticed that one thing that I, I had the problems for a very long time that, for example, using ROA textures, which were like 8K times 8K, and they had a super fine detail, and it looked perfectly, but if you use this... Um, texture somewhere in the distance from the camera it was all washed out you 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 couldn't see any kind of uh of this data detail it mm-hmm. was just washed out by anti-aliasing i tried a lot of stuff and finally i was just um manually uh, pumping up the contrast of these textures so these features from big distance were better visible because it were they were too fine for the render engine, let's say rendering in for not for just normal uh, s- uh, screen of a you know t- uh, computer screen, it was just disappearing. Mm-hmm. And I was just curious: is is Substance does have some functions which help to export textures which would go look good in various resolutions or you know in, in various um, distances from from the camera? Mm, I th- I think so. I mean, when you do put in, let's say, uh, texture, uh, SPSA for using your Substance plugin, or even when you export maps, you can dynamically change the resolution to 2K or 4K or even 8K. But mm-hmm. yeah, at that point, like if if it if it's a detail that it's it's it, that your render engine has to deal with, like that's really based on your final engine now, not really Substance anymore. I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I get it. Okay, yeah. so so uh, as as much as for me, I'm all uh, loaded with energy to to check it out. Mm-hmm. And by the way, guys, uh, on our uh, farm Gatchfarm.net, we support Substance. Also, we have a very cool thing that um, our plugin. Um, automatically relinks all your assets including textures and uploads them to the farm so the the paths are matching the paths on our farm and it all happens automatically and on top of that if you upload another version of the scene which is using the same textures the textures which are already uploaded are not uploaded again so it makes it very quick to, for example, upload six cameras of of the same of the same scene because the textures are uploaded only once, only once. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, thank you, Emil, for your time. It was very interesting conversation, both technically and in general. Mm-hmm. And yeah, good. I don't know. Just see you again <laughs> soon yeah. yeah yeah guys keep on keep on keep on rendering. playing and keep on and keep on mastering <laughs> yeah at the end of the day just dive in want to render stuff yeah. go to the farm want to make textures go to painter don't don't wait for the perfect time or opportunity or piece of tech to start moving because you never know where you're gonna end up and you never know what you're gonna end up learning yeah, yeah. Every, every journey start starts with the first step yeah so yeah, I guess that's yeah. it. See you guys around. See, See you guys. Around. Bye. Bye.